morning everyone, my name is Fran McGinnity. I'm an Associate Research Professor at the ESRI in Dublin. I lead research on integration and equality at the ESRI, including a large programme of research on integration. This project is a very interesting opportunity to compare migrant integration in Ireland and Northern Ireland. I'm going to present the introduction and then my colleague and co-author James Lawrence will take over and I'll wrap up at the end. I hardly need to tell you that migrant integration is hard to define. In this report, we try and look at it from a number of different angles, using a range of sources of evidence to build up a picture. This presentation aims to give a flavour of the key findings and we'll go quite fast, but the report is on the ESRI website if you want to read more. I should take this opportunity to thank the colleagues from the Shared Island Unit for their support of the project. ESRI colleagues Ashleen Hoy and Sarah Curriston for their input and Lucy Michael who acted as advisor. All three of them are at the event today. Particular thanks to the consultation participants for their time and insights. I see some of you made it here too. More about that later. In fact, there's a great range of people here from both North and South from very different perspectives and roles. It's great to see you all. Having been historically associated with emigration, inward migration in recent decades has been notable in both Ireland and Northern Ireland, though particularly here in Ireland. Migrants have a lot to offer, both the economies and the societies they come to, but can also face challenges, in economic and social integration, and there can be feelings of anxiety in the host population. Brexit, as you will know, has brought challenges for many on this island, with some additional ones for migrants. This is the first systematic comparison of the experience of and response to migrants and migration in Ireland and Northern Ireland. So now to our research questions. We begin by asking how many migrants, that's people born abroad, live in Ireland and Northern Ireland and where they come from. We consider the skills they bring, their age, where they live, as well as whether they are working in the nature of those jobs. Throughout, we compare them to their native born peers. We then consider migrant origin children in both jurisdictions, their achievement in English reading, in maths and science at age 15, and their well-being. The focus then switches to look at how migrants have been received. It uses high quality, internationally comparable survey data to compare attitudes to immigrants and immigration in Ireland and Northern Ireland. And finally, to examine migrants' recent experience of the border in Ireland, we organised a consultation event in October 2022 and in the report present key themes emerging. In conclusion, we reflect on some implications for policy and opportunities for learning. In defining migrants, we use international definitions, defining migrants as those who were born outside their country of residence. It's a little more challenging in this north-south comparison and we can discuss definitions at the end, though we don't expect this to affect our findings particularly. In both cases, we compare migrants to those born in Northern Ireland or those born in Ireland as a benchmark. None of the representative surveys we use measure ethnicity, so we can't distinguish ethnic minorities. I should also stress that nationality is not the same as country of birth. Some people born abroad are citizens of Ireland or British citizens if they live in Northern Ireland. This is an important point which we return to later. And of course, who is perceived as a migrant and treated accordingly may differ from this definition. We'll also return to this in discussion. In terms of methods, we combine desk analysis of policy and administrative statistics with representative survey data and also hold a consultation event on migrants' experience of the border in Ireland. These pie charts show the proportion of migrants in the working age population in Ireland and in Northern Ireland. The brown wedge shows that in Ireland, almost one in five people were born outside Ireland. In Northern Ireland, just under one in 10. That's, we're looking at the working age population. If we look at the columns here, we see that most migrants are European in both Ireland and Northern Ireland, around two in every three migrants from either EU West or EU East. The key advantage of the Labour Force Survey is that the data are harmonised between jurisdictions and so everything is measured in the same way. 
The disadvantage of the EU LFS is the detailed information on country of birth of respondents, our indicator of migration status, is only available up to 2019. So now we look at a profile of migrants, selected characteristics of those born abroad. We look at the proportion with third level qualifications, the proportion who live in cities and towns, and the proportion who are citizens of the jurisdiction that they reside in. We look at this separately in Ireland and Northern Ireland, and these are side by side for comparison. The first thing to point out is that migrants in Ireland are highly educated. Over half of them have a third level education and they are more highly educated than the native born population. The educational profile of migrants in Northern Ireland isn't quite so high, but still a higher proportion of them, 41%, have a third level qualification than those born in Northern Ireland. There are some striking group differences, however. EU East migrants aren't so highly educated in um, Ireland and particularly in Northern Ireland, where 22% of them have a third level qualification. If we look at where migrants are living, migration is often an urban phenomenon. And we see that in Ireland, yes, over 70% of migrants live in towns and cities. This is not the case in Northern Ireland, <clears throat> where just over half of all migrants live in towns and cities, and in particular, EU East migrants are much less likely to live in cities and towns, and also more likely, less likely than those born in Northern Ireland. Finally, if we consider the proportion of <clears throat> migrants who are citizens of where they live, in Ireland this is relevant to who counts under the travel area. Here we see that one third of those born abroad living in Ireland are Irish citizens. One in six in Northern Ireland, that's 17%, are British citizens. And we see considerably, um, <clears throat> so citizenship is higher in Ireland than in Northern Ireland. And we, can, we see considerably high rates of citizenship among certain groups of the population. So now I'll hand you over to James to discuss migrants at work. Thanks, Fran. So now we turn to looking at how migrants are actually faring in the labour market in Ireland and Northern Ireland. To begin with, we compare the rates of working age migrants who are in employment, who are unemployed and who are economically inactive and compare these to the labour market situation of people born on the island of Ireland. The figure is divided up into pairs of results. The upper bar of each pair shows the rates for people in Ireland, and the lower bar in each pair shows the rates for people in Northern Ireland. So, are migrants working? By and large, the answer is yes. Employment rates are very high for most migrant groups, and they are at least as likely to be in employment, if not more so, than non-migrants in both jurisdictions. This is particularly true for EU migrants and especially EU East migrants who are between five and 10 percentage points more likely to be employed than their non-migrant counterparts in each jurisdiction, especially in Northern Ireland. In both jurisdictions, non-EU migrants tend to have somewhat higher levels of inactivity compared to other migrant groups. This in part can be explained by the fact that a greater share of non-EU migrants come to the island to study who will be in this inactive group. One group of migrants in particular that stands out is the higher levels of inactivity among African migrants in both jurisdictions. As regards the low employment for this group in Ireland, this has persisted for at least a decade an earlier research that Fran was involved in suggests that for some African migrants, this may be due to having come through the protection system. For example, trauma in their home countries or time spent in direct provision, which can all affect people's labor market outcomes. Taken together though, most migrant groups do have high levels of employment in both Ireland and Northern Ireland. 
Another way of thinking about how well migrants are integrating into the labour market is to look not just at if they are employed or not, but at the quality of jobs they're working in. So one useful measure of job quality is whether people are employed in professional or managerial occupations, which generally have good pay and conditions. The following chart shows the proportion of different groups who are in employment who are working in professional and managerial occupations. In Ireland, the darker blue lines, and in Northern Ireland, the lighter blue lines. So looking at migrants as a whole, we see that a higher share of migrants in Ireland, 45%, are in professional and managerial jobs compared to in Northern Ireland, where only 35% are in professional and managerial jobs. Now this could reflect the high numbers of migrants in Ireland in things like the tech industry or in multinationals, which tends to encourage highly skilled migrant groups. Some migrant groups, such as EU West migrants, those from North America and Australia, and also Asian migrants, tend to be doing actually better than non-migrants in terms of the occupations they are in. And this is present in both jurisdictions. However, in both Ireland, but especially in Northern Ireland, EU East migrants are much less likely to be in professional and managerial occupations compared to their native counterparts. For example, only 12% of EU East migrants are in professional and managerial occupations in Northern Ireland, and this is compared to 44% of native-born workers. Instead, EU East migrants are much more likely to be working in, say, manufacturing roles, especially in the agri-food sector, as well as in retail and hospitality. We now turn to look at the experiences of the children of migrants on the island of Ireland, in particular their educational outcomes and their levels of well-being. So, how do we define whether children have a migrant background or not? In our study, children are defined as migrants if at least one of their parents was born abroad, although defining them as having two parents born abroad did not substantially shift our results. However, there are other dimensions of migrant children's lives related to their migrant status that could be important for their outcomes. So this includes whether they were born abroad and then moved to Ireland or the UK when they were children, what are known as first generation migrant children, or if they were actually born in Ireland or the UK, what are known as second generation children. So children's generational status might play a role. Alongside this, whether children and migrant children in particular speak English or Irish at home or not may also be an important factor in their outcomes. Both these factors are known to affect schooling and well-being. For example, by affecting how easy their socio-cultural adaptation is, or how difficult they find school having to learn a new language. We begin by looking at how migrant children are doing in schools in Ireland and Northern Ireland. This uses data from the Programme for International Student Assessment, during which children aged 15 undertook the same identical tests. So this allows us to directly compare the experiences of children in the two jurisdictions. These charts show us the maths and reading proficiency scores of non-migrant children and migrant children. However, as you can see, we subdivide migrant children into two groups. Those migrant children who were born abroad and then subsequently moved to Ireland or the UK as children, the first generation, and those migrant children who were actually born in Ireland or the UK, the second generation. What we see that is in Ireland, the pink bars, both first and second generation migrant children seem to be doing just as well, if not better, as non-migrant children in Ireland. This is evident in both maths and reading proficiency. In Northern Ireland, the blue bars we do find that second generation migrant children are scoring just as highly as non-migrant children. However, we also see that first generation migrant children are actually performing much worse 
in both maths and reading compared to non-migrants and second generation migrants in Northern Ireland. This is actually a substantively large difference in educational scores. It is twice the size of the difference in scores between children with parents who have a degree or higher and those children whose parents do not. And we know that parental education is a key driver of educational outcomes. So several factors might be at play here explaining this lower scoring amongst first generation migrant children in Northern Ireland. For example, this group tend to be somewhat less likely to speak English at home. Furthermore, first generation children of migrant background in Northern Ireland are also more likely to come from homes with lower socioeconomic resources compared to non-migrant children in Northern Ireland. These differences can account for some of the lower scores among this first generation of migrant children group in Northern Ireland, but they do not account for all of the difference in scores. So we next turn to looking at children's mental well-being. To measure this, we use an index of mental well-being composed of questions asked to the children on how often they felt various emotions, such as joyful, cheerful or happy. The figure in front of you shows the average levels of well-being for the same groups of children as we saw previously, both for Ireland and Northern Ireland. Here, lower scores equate to less positive feelings, to feeling less happy. What we see that is in Ireland, the pink bars, there are only relatively small differences in well-being between migrant and non-migrant children. In Northern Ireland, this time, we find first-generation migrant children appear just as happy as non-migrant children. However, this time, second generation migrant children appear to have much lower levels of happiness than non-migrant children in Northern Ireland. Their scores are over twice as negative. Interestingly, differences in things like their socioeconomic background, English language ability, or whether they live in villages, towns or cities, do not explain the lower levels of happiness of second generation migrant children in Northern Ireland. What does appear to account for some of these differences, however, is children's sense of school belonging. That's things like how far they feel like an outsider or are left out of things at school, whether they feel they belong at school or how far they feel lonely. And what we find is that second generation migrant children in Northern Ireland tend to have lower levels of school belonging. And this accounts for part of why they have lower levels of happiness compared to non-migrant children in Northern Ireland. So up to this point, we've been looking at the experiences of migrants themselves. But what we now want to look at is differences in the attitudes of non-migrants towards immigrants and immigration across the island of Ireland. To do this, we use the most recent comparative data we have available from 2017 and 2018. Understanding the attitudes of non-migrants towards immigrants and immigration is important. The attitudinal climate will affect how welcome migrants feel, their everyday experience and their well-being. And attitudes may also affect decision makers and the decisions that they make, be they employers, service providers or policy makers. So we begin by looking at how positive or negative people feel towards migrants from the EU and also towards migrants from outside the EU in both jurisdictions. The figures shown here show average levels of positivity towards EU migrants in Ireland and Northern Ireland in the left hand figure and average levels of positivity towards non-EU migrants in each jurisdiction in the right hand figure. We see that people in Ireland are more positive towards EU migrants than people in Northern Ireland are. We also see that people in Ireland are also more positive towards non-EU migrants than people in Northern Ireland are. Interestingly, in both jurisdictions, 
people are more positive about EU migrants than non-EU migrants. However, people in Ireland also are just as positive about non-EU migrants as people in Northern Ireland are about EU migrants. So another way of gauging people's attitudes towards immigration is by asking them to think of how positive or negative they think the impact of immigration will be on different aspects of their society. For example, its impact on things like the economy or the welfare system or on jobs or levels of crime. This figure before you calculates an average score of how positive or negative people think the impact of immigration will be across seven aspects of their society from the economy to crime. Here, higher scores equate to a belief that immigration, the impact of it, will be more positive on their society. We can see that, on average, people in Ireland believe immigration will have a more positive impact on their society than people in Northern Ireland do. This difference is actually stronger for some aspects of their society than others. For example, when asked about whether immigrants help to fill jobs for which it's hard to find other workers, only 3% more people in Ireland totally agree with this statement compared to Northern Ireland. However, 13% more people in Ireland totally agree with the statement that immigrants have an overall positive impact on their country's economy compared to in Northern Ireland. This then begs the question, why do we find that people in Ireland are more positive towards immigration than people in Northern Ireland? So previous research on what drives people's attitudes towards immigration has shown several key drivers. In the following slides, we investigate how far these key drivers of immigration attitudes differ between Ireland and Northern Ireland. In this first slide, we look at how far people believe they can influence politics, essentially how far they believe their voice counts. People who feel less able to influence politics and feel more disenfranchised tend to have more negative feelings about immigration. What this figure shows is that people in Ireland are much more likely to believe their voice counts in politics, both at a national level and at an EU level compared to people in Northern Ireland. Another key driver of immigration attitudes is how secure people think their lives are and their levels of optimism for their own and their children's futures. The following figure shows the answers of people in Ireland on the left-hand side and Northern Ireland on the right-hand side to the question, in your opinion, in five years time, do you think that your life conditions will be better, worse, or the same than today? Our analysis shows that people who are more optimistic about their future tend to have more positive attitudes towards immigration. So what this chart shows is that people in Ireland are much more optimistic about their future than people in Northern Ireland. In fact, nearly twice as many people in Ireland report that their life will get better in five years time 46% than in Northern Ireland, where only 24% report that their life will get better in five years time. The last key driver of immigration attitudes we look at is how much people have positive social contact with migrants. Having more migrant friends and migrants in one's family is a strong predictor, as we might expect, of more positive attitudes towards immigration. This figure shows us that in Ireland, people are much more likely to have migrant friends and family in their social networks than people in Northern Ireland. In fact, 68% of people in Northern Ireland have no migrant friends or family in their social networks. In Ireland, however, it's less than half, around 47%, who have no migrant friends or family. So in Ireland, people generally have more positive social contact with migrants than in Northern Ireland. So now we want to know 
how far do these differences in key drivers of immigration account for the more negative attitudes towards immigration that we've observed in Northern Ireland? In this next slide, we explore how far the lower levels of political efficacy, the less optimism for the future, and the lower levels of social contact with migrants might help explain the more negative attitudes towards immigration in Northern Ireland. The first figure on the left-hand side of the slide shows the average attitudes towards immigration in Ireland and Northern Ireland. Now this figure only accounts for demographic differences between people in each jurisdiction. For example, differences in their levels of education or in their social class. As previously shown, people in Northern Ireland view the impact of immigration as being less positive on society. And as can be seen, they have lower scores in the graph. Now we see that this gap changes very little when we account for demographic differences between people in Ireland and Northern Ireland. Essentially, demographic differences do not explain much of the difference in attitudes we observe. In the next three figures, however, we explore what happens to this gap in attitudes when we account for each of the key drivers of immigration attitudes. We find that when we separately account for differences in the political efficacy of people, differences in their optimism for the future, and the different levels of social contact with migrants, the gap in immigration attitudes between Ireland and Northern Ireland shrinks somewhat. However, as can be seen, the gap remains present in each case. Essentially, therefore, not one single driver of immigration attitudes can account for the gap between Ireland and Northern Ireland. In the final figure, however, we look at what happens when we account for all three drivers together. In this case, the gap in immigration attitudes between Ireland and Northern Ireland essentially closes completely. In other words, these findings suggest that the more positive immigration attitudes observed in Ireland can largely be accounted for by the fact that people in Ireland have higher political efficacy, greater optimism about their future life conditions, and are also more likely to have migrant friends and family in their social networks. It's important to say though, as we show in the report itself, that despite these differences, Attitudes towards immigration have been generally improving somewhat over time in both jurisdictions from around 2015 up to around 2020, the last data point we had at the time of the study. I will now pass you back over to Fran. Thank you, James. So now we switch perspective again and investigate the experience of migrants on the ground, so to speak, and how they find sharing the island. As many of you will know, a key element of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 was to dismantle border controls. The land border in Ireland is long, has around 400 crossings and is largely now invisible. We held an online consultation event to explore migrants' experience of cross-border travel and their ability to work and access services across the border. With thanks to all those who participated, I see some of them here. 17 organisations and individuals were based in Northern Ireland, five in Ireland and four worked cross-border or were involved in cross-border research. At the consultation, we made a presentation of our research project, summarised some findings from previous research and the questions we wanted to ask. For Irish and British citizens, the common travel area is an arrangement that means crossing the border counts as a local journey. For non-Irish and British nationals, the situation is rather different. We moved to breakout rooms in our consultation to discuss five questions and on return to the plenary session, a nominated rapporteur summarised the discussion. These summaries were recorded and transcribed with permission and quotes anonymously used in the report. The quotes are presented in boxes here in the next few slides. A key theme to emerge in discussion of cross-border travel was the issue of immigration checks at the border. 
and how ethnic minority migrants are much more likely to be checked than migrants who look the same as most people living in the island. This is not new, but heightened since Brexit. Research on discrimination highlights how in situations where information is lacking, stereotypes can fill that vacuum in information. In this case, for example, the stereotype may be most immigrants are non-white. Given some migrants cannot cross the border without permission, but as there are no routine border controls, non-white individuals are targeted for checks on the basis of race and ethnicity, while white migrants are much less likely to be stopped. Consultation participants described a sense of fear among migrants about travel across the border, even if the individual lives near it and crossings may be otherwise a normal part of life. As one participant said, people want to live their lives legally. They want to live in the open and the fear that any small incident or connection with authorities by accident or by necessity would unravel their lives is a significant challenge and fear underpinning much of this. Interestingly, participants reported more checks going from Northern Ireland to Ireland by Gardaí, especially on the Belfast-Dublin route. The next theme was about accessing work and health, education and events across the border. On health, there's been cooperation between health services north and south for 25 years, for example, in children's cardiology and cancer care and various initiatives to reduce waiting lists. Healthcare issues can be a particularly urgent and worrying one for migrants. In the quote there, there was an example of a child who needed cardiac surgery. The paediatrics hospital is in Dublin. The child's mother and father all had to get visas. And this was an extremely long drawn out process. In terms of cross-border work, frontier or cross-border workers are those who, can, uh, who live in one jurisdiction and work in the other. There is now a frontier workers permit in Northern Ireland, but its introduction was chaotic. It wasn't clear how it was going to work and even advisors didn't know what advice to give. For migrants working near the border, there's a chill factor where employers don't want to um, employ migrants if they can't cross the border freely. Lorry drivers are another group that frequently need to cross the border. A recurring theme in both work and services is confusion and uncertainty. The rules aren't clear, so migrants may then be wrongfully queried by employers or service providers, and this then adds to the fear. It's supposed to be an open border, but in reality, it's less open for migrants. There is also a sense of fr frustration expressed by participants. Several reported being tired of having to continually retell very personal stories of cross-border travel experiences to try and be heard and to try and get things changed. In terms of which migrant groups are most affected, the key issue determining those most affected in travelling across the border was skin colour. As one participant said, black and Asian people are more likely to be stopped more likely to be checked and they have difficulties going through checks and hospitals when it comes to accessing services and even difficulties when they have an ethnic surname. Particular challenges for asylum seekers and refugees, including Ukrainians, were flagged. Participants also raised the issue of multiple exclusion, layers of otherness. So if you're an excluded person by status, you're a person of colour, you're in a worse position. You're a person of colour with poor English, a member of the LGBT community. So basically, the more layers of otherness that you're tagged with, the more difficult it is to overcome those obstacles and the more obstacles you will face. Participants at the consultation event also discussed some potential solutions. What would make things easier? There were suggestions about coordinating visas, or permissions for resident non-EU nationals to cross the border. Also about training people who work in the front line and conduct these border checks to be clear on rules, to be clear on best practice and to have some monitoring of these random immigration checks. Sometimes when someone needs to enforce legislation but aren't informed, they can enforce it more strictly. Concerns were also raised about electronic 
travel authorization to enter the UK, if it's to be intelligence led and ad hoc checks, that it will be racial profiling all over again. And as we start, saw at the start of this presentation, there are a lot of migrants from other EU countries living in Ireland, so a lot of people will be potentially affected. So now this report covers a lot of themes. I'm just going to recap a few key points for you to take home or back to work. Firstly, inward migration has really changed Ireland and Northern Ireland. Most migrants are working, often in highly skilled jobs, though there are some exceptions. Migrant origin children can face challenges, especially in Northern Ireland. Attitudes to migrants are more favourable in Ireland than in Northern Ireland in 2018. Attitudes to migrants in Northern Ireland have actually become more positive since the Brexit vote. Migrants face challenges in cross-border travel, in work and in accessing services. As we saw, there are particular challenges around immigration checks and lack of clarity of rights. Turning now to policy implications of the findings, there's scope for policy learning both ways. In Ireland, up until very recently, much of the policy focus on questions of integration has been on migrant integration, while in Northern Ireland, following UK policy, there's been much more of a focus on the experiences of ethnic minorities. Both could learn from each other. In Ireland, focusing more on migrants misses the obstacles that people with migrant origin who were born in Ireland can experience, especially ethnic minorities. So racial equality policies and monitoring is critical to enable equal participation of all people in Ireland. This is why the government's National Action Plan Against Racism to be published later this month is a big step forward on this front. In Northern Ireland, focusing less on migrants misses the sometimes unique obstacles to integration that those born abroad may face, especially those who don't speak English so well, for example, and those East Europeans. <clears throat> Developing frameworks that can incorporate the experiences of both migrants and ethnic minorities ensures support for both groups. In Ireland, extra efforts and targeted supports may be needed for asylum seekers and refugees. There's also a need for greater clarity on migrants' entitlements, both in Northern Ireland and for crossing the border to avoid confusion, uncertainty and allow migrants to integrate and to share the island.